Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Father, we just thank you again for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you, Lord. Lord, what can we really ever give to you? You gave everything to us. You saved us. Lord God, you drew us out, Lord God, Father, of a dark pit. And you placed us in the heavenly kingdom. For just now we are in the kingdom. We're not waiting for the kingdom to come. For Lord God, you brought the kingdom, Lord Jesus. And you brought us into that kingdom. That glorious prayer before the Father. Father, they are no longer of this earth, neither as I am. For they received the word that I gave unto them. Hallelujah. They are now, Lord God, Father, part of the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you, Lord, Father, for your, for your mercies and your grace, which are new every morning. Thank you, Father, for putting up with us. And I say that personally. Thank you for putting up with me, Father. Lord, Father, it's so often it's so easy to get downcast. And it's so easy, Lord, Father, to, to struggle. But I thank you, Lord, Father, that in the mountains, the struggling, and the, you're always there with us, Lord, supporting us and strengthening us. Picking us up when we fall down, dusting us off, and Lord God, sending us on where we again rejoicing. Thank you, Father. I just pray your blessing now upon us. Open up our ears to hear your word and help me, Lord Father, to speak forth your word by the help of your Holy Spirit, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Um, my reading today, and um, or I'll start by saying, actually, I've got down here, we're on a war footing. And that's what I believe is taking place today. You've heard that expression, to be on a war foot is to be ready and to be prepared for a fight or for a war. Amen. I believe we're in a massive battle to now and sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Remember, the church seems to have forgotten we are at war and we are, we've always been at war, hallelujah, with our arch enemy, Satan and the demonic realm. I'll just read to you again just to refresh your memory. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're just going to read a couple of verses from Ephesians chapter 6. Glory to God, reading from verse 10, just to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to take a stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's good to be able to say I'm still standing after 37 years walking with the Lord. Yes, that I can still say today, I'm still standing. Hallelujah for his glory, and I give him all the glory. For if it wasn't for the Lord supporting me on this journey, I would have just been, I'd, I'd, I'd have been broken in the rocks. You know, that, oh, you hit the rocks, and I would have just been a, a, another casualty. And there seems to be so many casualties today within the house of the Lord, within Christendom. So many people have just, you know, have just crashed somewhere along the road, and they're, they're lying destitute. My heart goes out to them, because I say, I could easily be one of those prodigals lost someplace. And it was great just to be working yesterday with, with Matty, faithful Matty. But not just that, Matty's son, young Matthew, and my son, Benjamin, were working together with me and Matthew. And I was just, that was me, that was me working with Matthew and our two sons working together on that project. And it was just like, I just, I just, I thought it was a bit nostalgic. It was, but yet the two boys are outside the church and they need to be brought back in, hallelujah. And I get a little chance to kind of share with both of them, but we'll leave that with the Lord. And it's only the Lord that can bring them back. Glory to God. Our Bible reading today, I'm going to go to the book of Daniel. It's going to be on, I seem to be on this kind of war footing theme. Um, and that came off the back of my little series in Gideon over the last few weeks. And it just seems not to be leaving with me. So um, I'm just going to read a few scriptures here. Daniel chapter 11. And we'll probably break in at verse 29 and read, we'll read a few verses there, 35. At the appointed time, he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and to do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who will forsake the holy covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people 
who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and, and flame, by captivity and plunder. Now when they fall, they shall be added with a little help, but many shall join with them in, by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fail to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Hallelujah. For the appointed time. Glory to God. What we see here, we read about the man Antiochus the fourth, or he calls himself Epiphanes, if I'm pronouncing that name properly. And, um, and he was, this man was full of himself. Um, this man thought himself as a great and an illustrious, he seen himself as like an demigod. Uh, you know, that's what power, you know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And when people get so full of themselves, as this man was, he just would let, he, went, he, he rose beyond himself and seen himself as some mini deity and um, empowered by dark forces, no doubt. He's probably one of the greatest, of the great examples and types and shadows as Alan brought to us just a little bit. And last week was very well done, Alan, at the breaking of bread. He's one of the great examples of the Antichrist that is coming. And we have to remember he is coming. He's still to come. There's every possibility that he's kicking around the world just now. We're just waiting for him to be unveiled and to make his appearance. Do you know that Jesus was in the world for 30 years before he started his ministry? He was there, but nobody noticed him. He grew, he was in the midst of people. And then all of it, and then till the day he came when he went into the waters of baptism and, and was baptized in the River Jordan. When he came up, he was filled with the Spirit of God and he began his three and a half year in ministry. And this man also will probably also start a three and a half year reign of terror where the Lord Jesus Christ brought blessing. Jesus draws attention to Daniel in particular, the book of Daniel, when speaking of the abomination of desolation. Jesus actually says and quotes Daniel. So we can see that this is a very significant portion of scripture as we are living in these days, as many believe, and I get my hand up, that we are living in the last of the last days. And we're waiting for this appearance. And, and so we don't have to be caught unawares. We, Jesus says we should be able to understand the times and the seasons. If you, if you know the seasons and the, and, and the sun and, you know, and red sky at night, red sky in the morning, how can you not realize the times and the seasons that we should be living in? He's not left us in darkness. We might not know the day or the hour, but that doesn't mean you say we cannot understand the times and the seasons that we might be finding ourselves in, especially today. Some people, I believe, you know, as Daniel speaking of that will stand in the holy place, this abomination, which is in Jerusalem, is the center of the world. It is the place where the ultimate action and will take place is all around Israel, in particular, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a, is a prize, and it's a prize that Satan desires most above all. He doesn't want to be ruling the world from the White House, no matter how good that's never been in the White House. I, I presume it's a good house. And he's not wanting to rule from Westminster, number 10, or Buckingham Palace, or some great citadel across the world. He wants to rule the world from Jerusalem. He wants to replace Christ. He wants to stand in the Holy of Holies and declare himself, I am God and you will worship me. But he'll do this with force. Some people believe that, that he will, you know, there'll be a glorified idol, but other people believe it'll be the Antichrist himself who will dwell in there, whether one or the other, but there will be an idol set up. It doesn't say where it'll be set up. Will it be set up in the Holy of Holies? Will it be set up in the outer courts and inner courts? But an image will be set up by the second beast, which is the false prophet, and he'll be given power to bring that beast alive. Probably that goes back to Nebuchadnezzar's statute. You remember, you, will, you know, if anybody will not bow down and worship and give homage to this image, which probably did look like Nebuchadnezzar, although it was a giant thing, you know. And this image will probably look very much like the Antichrist, I would imagine. And, um, and everyone will be forced to, so if you're worshiping the image, you're actually worshiping the Antichrist. And we know about the mark. Hallelujah. But what we'll just do, we'll just have a little bit of kind of background just as we're leading up to the story here as well. Probably about 175 BC, he became this king. Antiochus became king of the northern kingdom. And he wanted to expand his empire. What is it with these kingdoms? You know, they, they're, not, they're not content with just having their own wee kingdom. I want somebody else's kingdom. It's a little bit like that, isn't it? You want to be bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And we know that Alexander the Great, in which was, was a catalyst for that Greek empire coming to the forefront. But if he died prematurely, he ran across the world. And we know he was empowered by Satan himself. He was the goat with the one horn. And it says, but then his empire was cut short and it went into the four generals. And then off one of these generals was a little horn. And this is the man that we are looking at here, Antiochus. And it says here, he, grew, he rose up, didn't he? And then, but it's Alexander, just let me go back to that. I mean, who impressed upon us the value of the Greek culture. And Alexander kicked across the world. Alexander wasn't just a great warrior, and listen, and he was a great warrior, but also he was schooled by Aristotle. He was a great philosopher, and he had, you know, his, his desire was he was going to Hellenize the world, or he was going to bring the Greek culture to the whole world, and as he conquered and conquered, not only did he conquer, but he brought the Hellenization or the Greek culture and its civilization everywhere he went. Plus, he was pretty open to receive other people's cultures, but he established the Greek culture. That's why at that time, the Greek language was the number one language. Aren't we lucky here as English, aren't we, that our language is now the world language? That spoils you. It stops you wanting to learn another language because we don't have to because we have got the world's language. Everybody tends to want to speak English. If you want to get ahead in the world, you need to speak English because that's the middle language of you from any other language. That's the, that's the number one language that you need to learn, if you, so they say. Maybe we'll be speaking Chinese soon. I don't think so. I've struggled with that. But anyway, hallelujah. Glory to God. And so we can see here, so the Greeks wanted to conquer and establish their culture. Although the Greeks seen themselves and their culture, they seen it as far superior to any other culture. And it probably was amongst the nations. Although Alexander was happy to learn as much as he could because he was a philosopher as much as a mighty warrior. His vision was for a multicultural empire with Greece dominating the field. Hence the reason their language dominated it. Their, 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 their civilization was way ahead of itself. Phenomenal. It still is making a massive input today of the Greek culture. And the Romans actually embraced a lot of that as well. Greek, Greco Roman culture that we probably have inherited today, but we can see these things. Let me see, just press the wrong button here, and this whole thing just wants to run ahead of itself. Let me just bring it back into order. What do we do without modern technology now? You have to sit there and you're dependent on a signal, or else you're the, play, the thing's dead. Once you've got your signal, though, just. It is, you get used to it, and then you can think, what do you do without it? Who knows what's going to happen in the future? So we can see here, we see Alexander then and, and, and his desire. So the four generals would have probably carried on with that. So probably around about that time, 175, Antiochus came and he took on for the north. But he was greedy to conquer other nations. And guess what? He attacked the south with Egypt and, and Palestine. Or Israel was right in the middle of it. And so there was always a battle to take control of Israel. They say probably in about 106 BC, Antiochus invaded Jerusalem. We read a little bit of that there in the scriptures as I read to you. He invaded Jerusalem. He captured the city. He marched into the Jewish temple, the Holy of Holies, and he erected a statue of the Greek god Zeus, sacrificed a pig in the altar of incense. He removed all of its treasures. He stripped it of everything. He searched the whole place, and, and then he took it all back with him, back to his base. And he says he probably dominated Jerusalem for, as they say, around three to four years. Isn't that interesting? We could probably say three and a half years. Isn't it interesting? The picture again, when he took control of Jerusalem, it took three and a half, just over three years. I would say probably three and a half years for that temple to have been cleansed. And we'll read about the heroes who are coming off the back of this. But he had control of it. And, and it says that it, the place was turned upside down. He defiled it greatly. All kinds of debauchery, all kinds of wickedness in the Holy of Holies. And the Lord allowed this. Then, well, Antiochus, he, at first, then he, said, then he demanded all the people in his empire, that they were to abandon their gods and their religious social culture. Everyone now had to conform to the Greek culture. No longer was he just going to accept everybody, that everybody could have a bit of their, their own culture and, and worship and, and other deities. Antiochus now demanded that everybody gave up their culture and everything was going to be brought to one culture, which was the Greek culture. That's why the book of Maccabees gives us great insight into those terrible days. And I'm going to read you a little bit from some of the passages of 1 Maccabees. And um, it's not seen as canon, 
But I want to tell you, this is still very profitable for us to read it from a historical background. And, um, and that will just encourage us along the journey. Hey, presto. Amen. Let me just read a couple of things just to bring you up to flavor of what was happening in those times. And I'm going to try and bring those times and bring a little bit fast forward to today. And we can maybe just see the trajectory in which we're on. And um, hallelujah. Let me just go back there because I'm, I'm, I need to find out what passages of scriptures. I'm jumping between the two. So two screens here. So we're going to read first of all from about 11 to 15. And, um, and we'll just read these scriptures here to you. Glory to God. It says, at that time there appeared in the land of Israel a group of traitorous Jews who had no regard for the law and they had a bad influence on many of the people. They said, let's come to terms with the Gentiles. Our refusal to associate with them has brought us nothing but trouble. Their pro proposal appealed to many people and some of them became so enthusiastic about it, they went to the king and they received from him permission to follow the Gentile custom. They built in Jerusalem a stadium like those in Greek cities. They had surgery to perform to hide their circumcision, abandoned the Holy Covenant, and started associating with the Gentiles. And they did all sorts of other evil things. So we can see here, many of them began to conform to the Gentile nations around them. They says, look, why are we fighting against them? Listen, it'd be better for us to, you know, to, 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 get, to get much more closer to the Gentile world. We are standing apart here, and you know, God's told us to be separate, but look, let's just, let's just... Let's just begin to, you know, get, get to know the Gentiles and, them, and, and start to receive a lot of their customs. So we see how the devil works sometimes very, very subtly. He kind of wears us down and that worldly influence and the Hellenization program was phenomenal. It was, it was, it was you know, it, it was very attractive and it's so easy to get sucked into it because you're stuck there and with the law and going through the mundane things in the younger generation. It was the games and, you know, the sports, Olympic games, oh, javelin. I don't know if Hercules was kicking around in that day, but so it was so, it, it just caught them and many of them were abandoning the faith and they get caught up in the system of the world and all of that was taking place at that particular time. So many of them ran after all of these things. We'll read just another portion. We'll read from 37 to 43. Let me just fast forward up here. 37 to 43. Innocent people, when he first went in to, de to, to devastate Jerusalem, innocent people were murdered around the altar. The holy place was defiled by murderers. The people of Jerusalem fled in fear, and the city became a colony of foreigners. Jerusalem was foreign to its own people, who had been forced to abandon the city. Her temple was as empty as the wilderness. Her festivals were turned into days of mourning. Her Sabbath joy into shame. Her honor became an object of ridicule. Her shame was as great as her former glory, and her pride was turned into the deepest mourning. Antiochus issued a decree that all the nations in his empire should abandon their own customs and become one people. All the Gentiles and even many of the Israelites submitted to this decree. They adopted the official pagan religion, offered sacrifice to his idols, and no longer observed the Sabbath. Amen. So we can see there was a tolerance to begin with as it began to just to begin to, you know, to gain influence. And then what happened was now he demanded now your, your allegiance and your obedience. Up until then, he was, it was up to yourself whether you gave it, but then eventually he turned and he demanded your allegiance and demanded then you give up your natural place of worship. And then we can go back up here. Now, just read a few verses here from 54 in the same chapter. And the 15th day of the month of Kislev in the year, and it's not actually 145 here, I think it's 167. King Antiochus set up the awful horror of the altar in the temple. Pagan altars were built in the towns throughout Judea. Pagan sacrifices were offered in front of houses and streets. Any books of the law which were found were torn up and burned. And anyone who was caught with a copy of the sacred books or obeyed the law was put to death by order of the king. Month after month, these wicked people used their power against the Israelites caught in their towns. There was great devastation. He came against anyone who still wanted to practice their Judean Christian faith. Mothers who had allowed their babies to be circumcised were put to death in, a, in accordance with the king's decree. Their babies were hung around their necks and their families and those who had circumcised them were put to death. But many people in Israel firmly resisted the king's decree and they refused to eat food that was ritually unclean. 
They preferred to die rather than break the holy covenant and eat unclean food. And they did die. In his anger, God made Israel suffer terribly because of the wickedness of Israel. And again, we have to have a clear view of who this God is that we serve. Yes, he's a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. And when a nation turns from God and God turns against the nation, he turns us over to wicked forces. It's all through Old and New Testament. I believe this the duration that we probably find ourselves even in the land of Scotland in such a place as today. But glory to God, there is hope. Just painting the picture for us as we move forward there. Glory to God. This provoked a revolt in Judea as the Jews fought to remove Antiochus' sacrilege from the temple. There was an uprising. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank God for an uprising. Thank God for righteous people who are willing to stand up. And we'll just read another little portion of scripture here and then I'm going to kind of finish this up here. So we go to chapter 2 and um, of Maccabees. Now enters the phrase, Mattathias, a priest, hallelujah, who had five sons. First son was called John, and the second, the second son was called Simeon, uh, Simon, sorry, the, the third son was called Judas, also called Maccabeus, who the book is probably Maccabeans, is called after. Fourth son was Eliza, and then Jonathan was the fifth son. Isn't it interesting there was five sons? Immediately I thought about David when he picked up five stones to overcome Goliath. Is there some symbolism in that, in the five? I do not know. It's just an interesting way to look at that as well. When David was only come the giant. Then we read about this man. Mattathias saw all the sins that were being committed in Judea and Jerusalem and he said this. Why was I born to see these terrible things, the ruin of my people and the holy city? Must I sit here helpless while the city is surrounded by enemies and the temple falls into the hands of foreigners? The temple is like someone without honor. Its splendid furnishings have been carried away as loot. Our children have been killed in the streets and our young men by the sword of the enemy. Every nation in the world has occupied the city and robbed her of her possessions. All her ornaments have been stripped away. She is now a slave, no longer free. Look at the temple profaned by the Gentiles, emptied of all of its splendor. Why should we go on living? In his grief, Mattathias and his sons tore their clothes, put on sackcloth, and continued in deep mourning. And so we can see the times at the season that they were living in. They were horrific times, terrible times. And the people were in deep shock when they seen, that, where was the God in the midst of this? I'm sure we could probably fast forward to the Holocaust years and none of us could even begin to imagine what it must have been like if you were living in Auschwitz or one of these other Holocaust camps and the things that they were subjected to. And that wasn't that long ago. We visited Auschwitz, Linda and myself, and then we've done a little tour. I've watched a lot of videos. And I, I, don't, I, I don't know how that you could imagine ever living in those days and the terrible wickedness that erupted under Hitler and the Nazis. Anyway, glory to God. Let's just reflect upon a little bit of history here. Let me just read on and then we'll open it up a little bit. Glory to God. Then the king's officials were forcing the people to turn to God and they came to the town of Moedim where Matthias had turned, had left to just to escape, to force the people there to offer pagan sacrifices. Many of the Israelites came to meet them, including Matthias and his sons. And the king's official said to Mattathias, you're a respected leader in this town. You have the support of your sons and your relatives. Why not be the first out here to do what the king has commanded? All the Gentiles, the people of Judea, and all the peoples left in Jerusalem have already done so. If you do, you and your sons will be honored with the title of friends of the king, and you will be rewarded with silver and gold and many gifts. Mattathias answered in a loud voice, I don't care if every Gentile in this empire has obeyed the king and yielded to the command to abandon the religion of our ancestors. My children, my relatives and I will continue to keep the covenant that God made with our ancestors. With God's help, we will never abandon his law or disobey his commands. We will not obey the king's decree and we will not change our way or worship in the least. And we know just as he finished it says some man stepped up and was going to actually offer up that sacrifice and Matthias attacked him and killed the officials and killed this man. And it says then he, a guerrilla warfare began. 
And, um, and they rose up. This little kind of catalyst now was starting. God's warriors now were aroused and they, and they rose up. Hallelujah. It says in verse 27, Then Methesias went through the town shouting, Everyone who is faithful to God's covenant and obeys his laws, follow me. With this, he and his sons fled into the mountains, leaving behind all that they owned. And here we now, here we see now that the, 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 the uprising had begun. A godly group of people now, and God had now started something, and they ran into the hills where they were going to actually grow into a mighty army. Hallelujah. Let me just read the final little portion here, and then we'll, we'll move on with the rest of the sermon. It's, it's 45. I'm just going to go up to 45. We know then that they tried, to, they tried to kill this little group, but they just kept growing. And by the help of God, they overcame the enemies, a very powerful army. It's amazing what God can do with something small when something small is committed to him. Hallelujah. Oh, it took a David to take out a Goliath. Hallelujah. And we could look at many other examples. But listen to Matthias' last words to his sons before he died. He said this to his sons. These are times of violence and distress. Arrogant people are in control and have made us an object of ridicule. But you, my sons, must be devoted to the law and ready to die to defend God's covenant with his ancestors, with our ancestors. Remember what our ancestors did and how much they accomplished in their day. Follow their example and you will be rewarded with great glory and undying fame. Remember how Abraham put his trust in the Lord when he tested and how the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Joseph, in his time of trouble, obeyed God's commands and became ruler of the land of Egypt. Phineas, our ancestor, because of his burning devotion, was given the promise and his descendants would always be priests. Joshua was made a judge in Israel because he obeyed the command of Moses. Caleb brought back a good report to the community and was given part of the land as a reward. David was made king and given the promise that his descendants would always be kings because of his steadfast loyalty to God. Elijah, because of his great devotion to the law, was taken up to heaven. Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were saved from the flames because they had faith. Daniel was a man of integrity, and the Lord rescued him from the mouth of lions. Take each of these ancestors of ours as an example, and you will realize that no one who puts his trust in the Lord will ever lack strength. Don't be afraid of the threats of wicked man. Remember that he will die and all his splendor will end with worms feeding on his decaying body. Today he may be highly honored, but tomorrow he will disappear and his body will return to the earth and his scheming will come to an end. But you, my sons, be strong and courageous in defending the law because it is through the law that you will earn great glory. This word, praise his wonderful name. Amen. Can we see a, a parallel picture of the events unfolding before us today, just as it happened yesterday? The Bible is a prophetic book. We heard that very clearly on Wednesday night. And everything written in this book will come to pass. There will be terrible times in the last days. There will be an antichrist, the ultimate antichrist, the one who is going to be filled with the spirit of Satan, is going to rise up in this world. And there's going to be dark days for this world. And he's going to be given rule for three and a half years to carry out great atrocities. And the Lord says, this is a time for you to be strong and to be faithful. And the Lord will give you strength for those who will receive it. Now, for all of you who believe we're not going to be kicking around for those last three and a half years, God bless you. I, I, I would like to hope that is true. I'm very happy to be taken out whenever the Lord desires to take us out. But in the meantime, I am planning to, to be a fighter and to be a warrior. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm planning to be here for the long haul. And if it doesn't happen, then glory to God. But I'm setting myself a task. Everything will come to pass according to these holy scriptures. This must, this must be fulfilled. We looked at that on, on Wednesday night and it was phenomenal Wednesday night. See, when you actually look and you see this book, about a third of this book is totally prophetic. Everything that the Lord has said has already been done according right to the letter. They say the chances of that to have happened is like billions and billions to one, and yet it happened. Do you know why? Because we, we serve the supernatural God. What he says will be done. You can guarantee it 100%. It will come to pass. That is the great hope we have as a people of God. God has given his word, his precious promises are yes and amen, and his glorious son, Yeshua Christ Jesus. 
We know, we know, we know. Hallelujah. I was saying that to this young man, Robbie, last night as we were kind of sharing the gospel. I says, if I drop down dead, I'm going to go and be with my Lord. I know, I know, I know. Hallelujah. And as my big friend George used to say to me when I told him I get saved away back in 1986, and he says, you've been brainwashed, man. You've been brainwashed. There's a load of rubbish. You're going to die and you'll find out it's a load of rubbish. This is George, according to your philosophy. Yes, I have been brainwashed. I have now totally believed in the Bible. I believe there's a God, there's a heaven, there's a hell. I believe in angels, I believe. And I said, but George, according to your philosophy, my friend George, see if I die and, there's, and, and, and it's not true, I'll never know <laughs> because you just don't exist. I said, you'll never know. So I've given myself a happy thought. But then I turned to him, I said, but George, what if it is true? And then he just kind of looked at me and that kind of real, and then, ah, you're talking rubbish, man. And that, that was the end of a friendship. And um, how can two walk together unless we're in union? Now my totally had changed. I was telling that young man, Robbie, that last night. And it's good just sometimes to remember where we came from. So we know that everything is said, it's done. It will come to pass. I've got down here, as surely as the law of gravity keeps your feet in the ground. You can't see gravity, but you know it's here. You know why? Because we're stuck here. <laughs> unless anybody's floating about. Oh, look, there's a balloon up there on that ceiling. <laughs> It always bugs me when I see these things. I like to get that balloon. But anyway, I'll get a wee dart or something. We'll spear it and we'll get it down. Gravity. It's unseen, but guess what? It keeps us rooted to the ground. Hallelujah. God's word is solid. Far greater than gravity, I might add. Glory to God. It keeps us grounded in the Holy Scriptures. That's where we should be. That's where our trust should be. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So we can see here as we look and we can draw the parallels to the last days. The Bible tells us the man of sin will rise to power with a mandate from Satan to destroy the Judean Christian values. There's so many that values of the so-called Christian nations, the children of Abraham and Bible-believing Christians. I say Bible-believing Christians because just because you're yourself a Christian doesn't necessarily mean you are. A Christian should be a follower of Christ, a believing Christian that believes. I speak to people all the time, don't we, Liz? You people, I, I believe. Everybody believes, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I said, my friend, I'll talk to you for a couple of minutes and at the end of two minutes, I'll tell you if you believe in Jesus. You, know, you just know, don't you? You just know when somebody believes. You're talking to someone, there's, that, there's an affinity there, isn't it? You just look and you just know when somebody you're talking to a believer. You know, you're talking to somebody else that's talking hot air, like that helium balloon stuck to the ceiling up there. Glory to God. We know all of this will take place and there's going to be an attack in the last days. Revelation 12 will fill you in for that there as well. But I've got down here, the church has been under a concentrated attack for many, many years. And it's left it weak and vulnerable to the attacks of the evil one. We just didn't see it coming. We've been sleeping for far too long. We've, we've let our guard down. We, we, we've, we've, been, we've just been, we've been taken, we've been caught off guard is another expression. And we've allowed the enemy now to take the massive upper hand. And we're seeing now as we live even in this nation, but across the westernized so-called world, the so-called Christian nations now are falling 10 to the penny. The government has been walking over the top of us and forcing us to lower our values and more inclusive, to be more inclusive and be more tolerant so we've been forced to lower our values. We no longer hold to the, the great values of the scriptures. Now we're just we're having to tone them down a little bit. We're told to accept false, religion, false religions as equals, predominantly Islam. But, you know, we've, we've been told we need to accept them as equals. And sinners, and we've been told to accept sinners as Christians as well. We need to, we've been told to do that, drop our values. As long as they love God, they can live any way they want to. That means as a man or a woman or whoever whatever takes your fancy. You, people now can choose to be whoever, can change their identity and we are being forced to what, to accept that. Many churches are flying the colours of the LBGT plus Q and I think we've got a few other pluses added on to that now. I don't know where, the, where I think we're going to have a full alphabet by the end of it but we keep adding on other and, and including more and more and more ways. Many churches though are flying the LGBT. I've seen them often. Many churches flying the, the colors of the LGBT community, endorsing their values, even marrying same-sex couples and blessing their union before God. Making it unlawful to, and, and the government also is making it unlawful for us to preach the gospel or to challenge sinful behavior, to say anything at all 
which might actually, if people would find offensive, don't say anything against abortion, don't say anything against, you know, any sexual matters, don't say anything against this, that. And, and we are now being told to build up, shut up, keep it to yourselves, but don't bring it into the public squares. And much of the church has been compliant, and much of the church now is actually endorsing it and just saying, oh, come on, it's the 21st century, as if God is still evolving. You know, you know God's he's changing, you know, come on, man. It's on the 21st century just now. God is moving on. Do you know, the Lord is, says, I am the I am. God is fully evolved. He is who he is. He will always be who he is. Always. He will never change. You can, you know, you can just, you know, he, he is. And that's wonderful, isn't it? That God is never going to change his mind. What he says is what he means, and he means what he says. That's why we can have great faith in this Lord, this great God that we serve. Hallelujah. He never changes. He is the complete one. But we're living in these days. We're seeing all of this tide of wickedness coming against us and we've been sitting back for far too long and we've been dominated by the enemy. Hallelujah. What I'm to BC and AD? I forget how many years ago then they brought into the schools. It's no longer BC, which is before Christ, and AD, which is Anno Domini, which is Latin for the year of the Lord. The whole calendar was based around this man, Yeshua, Christ Jesus. And then they says, no, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not. Actually, that, you know, now they've changed it to BCE, before Common Era, and Common Era. Listen, that's been changed for years. <laughs> yes, it's been changed for years, ladies. I can't even remember. Years since the, and so in the public schools now, it's BCE and CE. So, so it's, it's before Common Era, and it's Common Era. So it's no longer BCAD. And again, it's just, this is just a frontal attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it went, did, did the church, was the church in an uproar? How did we rise up and declare this is wrong, this is, this is terrible? It came in the back door. I call it, you know, there's, there's a certain aircraft. I don't think you've had the privilege to fly in this one, Paul. He's been flying all over the place, as, as many other people. It's called a stealth aircraft. And it's designed to go undetected, fly under the radar. Uh, you know, I think it costs an absolute fortune. But this one is designed so it can be picked up on the natural radar and by the sophisticated machinery that the world has. Call them stealth bombers. Amen. So they go undercover. And the enemy has been flying over with these stealth bombers, attacking the church, bombing us regularly, regularly. And it's went unseen under the radar of the church. And, you know, we've never seen them coming. But the damage is collateral. Churches closing all over the place. Many Christians caught up with the spirit of the world, drawn into the world because the world is a very alluring place. Listen, it's a very alluring place. It's like, you know, as the Bible says in Proverbs, it? it says, wine sparkles in the glass, but at the end, it bites like a viper. Hallelujah. And that's ultimate, the end of those who will partake of its fruit. So we can see these things taking place and it went on for far too long. But even in that time of Israel, it, it went, I mean, the people were being battered and battered and, and the enemy came in like a flood and then made demands upon them and everyone now was at a point, but God had something in store. Hallelujah. Mattathias and his sons was just sitting waiting for a moment in time when God was going to trigger them off and they never actually planned that. It just was orchestrated by God when it came into Mohadim and this man's anger rose up. How dare you? And he says, do you know, it says, they went after the leaders. You're the leader and your sons, you are leaders in the city. Why don't you lead the way? Why don't you go first? Because everybody will follow your example. You know, they'll say, follow your leaders. We're seeing that with the government, isn't it? They're, they're so-called leaders, but guess what? They're leading us off. They're leading us down the wrong road. They've been leading us down the wrong road. The government have been leading us down the wrong road for a long time. And everybody's just going ahead with it and following the leaders. But even to our shame in the church, I don't want to put the boot in against the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, or, 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 or even the Church of Scotland and the, the, the hierarchy and these levels and one thing or another. Even, dare I say, in a lot of so-called spirit-filled churches as well who are just conforming. They've not actually seen the times and the seasons that we're living in. This wickedness that's came like a dark cloud. I talk to people, this boy Robbie, he, he recognizes it. My son, who's not even in the church just now, but this means he's abandoned his faith. They recognize it. Everybody knows there's something, there's, this, this, this world's changed. This darkness, there's, there's something going on and we, we can't, it's, it's tangible. We see the way the whole culture has been under attack now till we get to such a way. How did we get here? Are we looking for a government to be the answer of our problem? 
Listen, the church of the living God is the answer to our problem. And we're waiting for a voice. We're waiting for an uprising. That's why I've got, we're on the war foot. And I seem to have been there. And it seems to be. And, and I think people in this church will testify. I, I, I've been there for the last couple of years. Not just, listen, not just standing against COVID. Like, listen, I've also went out, you know, taking a message around the, the eight cities of Scotland. Albeit, maybe there wasn't a lot of people listening. But I was still called to do that. And I felt to do that. I've been in Greyfriars Cup Yard when I called the, for a day of repentance for the churches. And very few people actually responded. But glory to God. But I felt the Lord to put that. That was a time to get before God and take and, and, and cry out to him. Repent of our sins as a church. To stand before him. Acknowledge our own sin. Personally, the sin of the church. And then... Asking God's mercy upon the nation. How can you just go, oh God, forgive the nation when you have to start with yourself first? Lord, forgive me. The great pair of Daniel, we read that at Great Friars Courtyard. Daniel says, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner, my family's a sinner. And then he went on and then he, and then he works towards the nation. Listen, it all begins with you and begins with me. Hallelujah. We start from the in, inside out. Amen. So, oh Lord, forgive them, filthy sinners, and forgive that. And no, no, you have to start with yourself. You know, Lord, forgive me. Hallelujah. I bring myself before you. Cleanse this house and then we, we work outwards as Josiah did when we came to restore the temple. You work in and you work out. Hallelujah. And we get the things sorted. But let me just, um, the verse that actually started all this, it was a catalyst, was actually chapter 11, Daniel and verse 32. So those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. That means people who will break their covenant with God. Satan is a, a flatterer. He will bribe you. Come on. Do you remember, I remember that article and the guy is standing in the bus shelter and he's, he's, he's struggling with alcohol and the guy's going up to him and goes, come on, do you want a drink? Go on. You know you want it. You ever get that? That temptation, isn't it? And that temptation comes in all kinds of sizes. Whatever you're struggling with, Satan's a master. He knows your Achilles heel. That could be pride. That could be, that could be a multitude of things. But he'll try and get you, he'll flatter you and he'll, and he'll fling temptation your way. Just come on, just, you know, what's all saying? You give the devil an inch and he's going to take a mile. As soon as you give him a little foothold, he's hooked and he's going to start to reel you into the place of destruction. But anyway, the second part of this verse is, it says, but the people who know their God shall be strong and they will carry out and do great exploits. And here was this man predominantly, um, Judas, um, Judas, uh, who was called um, um, Judas, who was called Maccabeus, the hammer. He was the, he was the leader of the forces of his one of the, the five sons. And we know what they did. They conquered. They actually overcame the Greek, the Greeks. They were one of the greatest fighting forces in the world. They overcame them. Stood against them. And God miraculously, see, see, when you read the book of Maccabees, the, the, the book of Maccabees, first Maccabees, second Maccabees, you see supernaturally God undertaken for them. There was, there was angels were seen in the heavenlies. There was, there was, they were, they were in wars and people could see angels beside Maccabees and when they were fighting, there was, there was heavenly beings that were seen in the midst of them fighting in their behalf. Hallelujah. God did an amazing work because there was what? There was a group of people who determined, they said, enough is enough. And they raised the battle cry and they, and they stood up and began to challenge the work of the enemy. This, I believe, is something that God is planning to do as we move into the latter days. I mean, so often, I mean, sometimes we can do ourselves injustice, ladies, because we think we're, we're, you know, or whoever, you know, you might believe that we are out of here. <laughs> I, 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 I tend to think we're, we're here just now. And it's time for us to fight. It's time for us to stand up. It's time for us to speak out. It's time for us to find our voice. We need to be a voice and we've lost our voice. We need to regain that voice. We need to be willing to stand up, speak out, take a stand and say enough is enough. It's time for the church. The nation out there is waiting to hear a voice and the only voice that they, that they need to hear is coming from the church. The church is the only one that's got the answer to this problem. This is a spiritual problem and it's the church that needs to rise up individually and collectively and find our voice to be the warriors that God is planning for these latter days. I tend to think is that if, if the template when Jesus says, as they look at Daniel for that Antichrist figure who will arise, and Antiochus Epiphanes was probably one of the greatest examples, for he was the one that went into the temple and set up and desecrated for three and a half years. But it says, but God raised up a group of warriors, hallelujah, the Maccabeans, 
And they rose up and they were a catalyst. I believe in these latter days, God is looking for that and he's putting together a remnant of people that he's going to be, he's planning to raise up and we are going to see the power of God like we've never seen before working in our midst for those who will put their trust in God and be, and be zealous for the house of the Lord. I'm having to stir myself up more and more, guys. It's not speaking to yourself, I'm speaking to myself. We need to be much more are we aware of the wickedness? Do we see the wickedness? Do we see the number of children that are being aborted across our nation? Are we seeing the number? Of, do you know there was a statistic came out yesterday? A record level of people who are changing their sex in Britain. There's a, the record number has increased dramatically just the other day there. The record number, as they did this um, survey, the record of number of people now who are totally confused about their sexuality. Do you know why? Because they're teaching it. Because they're feeding this into the young children's mind. They're feeding it into young children's mind. They're teaching it in more schools. Not all schools, but a lot of schools. It's everywhere. It's in the playgrounds. It's, it's everywhere. And they're getting indoctrinated and indoctrinated. This wickedness, this Hellenization of the latter days is taking place. And for far too long, we've been silent. Amen. And it's time for us now to, to rise up and get angry and begin to rise up take hold of the Lord and then to, to stand up and to begin to speak out. And I can tell you this, it is going to bring trouble. I'm going to finish with this scripture. Hallelujah. And it's in Isaiah. Didn't realize I spoke for so long, but people can say, Arthur, you can talk for Scotland. And I says, well, praise God. Um, one day I trust I will have a greater voice for this nation in Scotland. But let me just finish with this. I want to finish on a high, guys. And I want to encourage us. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, but we need to get rise up, friends. For God is looking for people and says, who's for me? Who is for me? Hallelujah. It says this in Isaiah 60. I'm just going to read two verses. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And I believe in these latter days, hence the reason we call ourselves Eastgate Church, I am believing we'll see the glory of God again in the house of the Lord. And we'll see the glory of God in our lives. Hallelujah. And we will see God again being exalted in this nation, not only in Scotland, but England, Ireland, and Wales. Hallelujah. We will see again God. There's a battle for Britain just now. It's a battle for Scotland. And it's time for us to just to enter the battlefield. Glory to God. And rise up and begin to speak out and declare the word of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'll tell you one story. And just in finishing, here we go, I'll have a story because um, I, I, don't, I don't think he'd probably mind. But anyway, I won't mention his name. But I have mentioned it somewhere already. But anyway, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Listen. A young man, his mother was on the way to an abortion clinic. She was that close. She was on her way. She made up her mind. Everybody encouraged her. Come on, well, look, you know, you're not ready for it. Circumstances. Now, listen, I'm not here speaking against any woman that's in an abortion. She doesn't see she's doing right. She's been told by the government, look, it's fine. It's great. It's nothing. It's not even a baby. It's a, it's a bunch of cells. It doesn't, it's a fetus. Isn't it amazing how we change the language as if it makes it slightly different than what it actually is? Anyway, she was going. She was heading for that termination period. And, and you know, sometimes a lot of people are under massive pressure. I get it, listen. But somebody stopped her on the way and stopped her in her tracks and says, think again. Think again of what you're doing. There is another way, you know. You, this, could be, this could be different. And do you know something? It was a divine intervention that moment. She stopped and she turned and she turned back. That young man He's now expecting his fourth child and he's doing great. But a moment of time, just in the balance, unknown to him, his life was on the line, glory to God. But because somebody spoke up and spoke out, glory to God. He's thriving today. Glory. Do you know something? If it's just one person that we can save, if it's just one person we can turn around, if it's just a small group, then glory to God. The angels rejoice over one Hallelujah, they get saved. Brethren, can I just encourage all of us? You never know who you're going to speak to. There was guys came and did these deliveries. I could have just let this go and just said, right, okay, guys, give us a ticket, right? Sign it off, right? Thank you very much and bye. But I've always, when I get saved, I always said, I need to share the gospel. I used to work for myself and everywhere I went, I thought, I need to tell people about Jesus. 
even to the point was, and I had to struggle because I wasn't an actual communicator. I know you sound that, I know you just kind of look and think, oh, yeah, I believe that. Well, I was, I was a bit shy. And as I started to work for myself, every house I went in, now I was into a house doing a wee job, and I was like, how do I tell that person about Jesus? And then it was a case of, you know, it was like, and I'd always find a way of talking to them about Jesus. I'd just say something. I remember I was up in Castlemilk area or something, and I, I did a bit of follow up after Double Glazing Company, you know, the plasters all the walls, and I was going to be a bit of plastic. And this guy was a bit of a tough nut, you know, a bit of a hard case. I bottled it, to be honest with you. I'm sitting there. I'm thinking to myself, you know, like, and it just wasn't an opportunity. And I went, right, okay. And is that you finished? Right, sir, that's fine. So I went down and I get into my van, Wisdom Building Services, Proverbs 9 and 10, just for you offset. I was like, right on the side. And I came down, I get into the van, I was like, I was under conviction. I went, Lord, that says I'd tell everybody with Jesus. And I went, I'm going back. <laughs> so I went back and I chapped the door. It was one of those ones that was an upstairs room. So you, it's up there and, the, and, the, and the, the door was kind of opened them up. Aye, all right, mate. It says, eh. Uh, you forget something, you left something. I mean, oh, I says, oh, I forgot to tell you something. Aye, what's that then? I says, I should have told you I was a Christian and I, and, and I was wanting to tell you a wee bit about God, what God's done in my life. And I went, aye, okay then, thanks very much for that, you know, and that was it. Do you know something? I went back to my van, I opened up the door and the joy of the Lord was there. And I just, I just left it with the Lord because fear sometimes can hold us back. Guys, I shared the story about one person that, okay, that a, a lady that was going to make a decision that totally changed her, but that could be anything, that could be anywhere. You could just meet someone. You never know what's going through someone's life. You never know what somebody's going through somebody's mind. You could speak to somebody unknown to you. They could be going to, fro- they could be going to end their life or something. They, they, they could be in a terrible place and just by us, just taking advantage of and just, since, just sharing a little bit. It just has to be a little bit. We can just share a bit about the God. Who knows? Who knows the the, the what that could accomplish in the grand scheme of God. I want to encourage you as always, time for us to find our voice again. Maybe you've been quiet for too long, start to speak out, start to share again. And I'll tell you this, there's going to become a day and there's going to be great rewards for us in the kingdom of God and the people up there and say, hey, do you remember I was in Paisley and you? <laughs> God bless you. Father, we just thank you again for today. Lord, Father, help us to realize we're part of an army. Help us to realize, Father, that the, the We're in the midst of a war, a war of darkness against light, Father. Lord, I pray, help us today. Stir us up, Lord God. Stir up our zeal. I pray, Father, you will, Father, encourage us today, Lord God, Father, to be more vocal, to be more, Lord God, Father, Lord, visible in this world in which we live in, Lord. Father, we might be the salt and light you've called us to be, the body of Christ, Lord, in a very difficult world. I just pray a blessing now upon every single one of us. I pray you will help us and strengthen us and meet the needs of your people this day. Jesus is Christ. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help, support, and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.